Hello everyone. I'll see if we can get started. Um, there's a couple of items that we need to do before we actually get into the training. This is kind of uh, hands-on-ish kind of training. And um, you know, you're welcome to follow along. Otherwise, hopefully this recording works and, and you, can, you can watch this later on uh, on demand. There is, since we're gonna be using Pattern Lab um, for our components, we need to install a couple of things. And I don't know if you looked at the uh, page for, for this. Uh, at the top, I added a quick instructions on what we need to install. One is Node.js. So does everybody have Node.js installed? Okay, and if not, just go to nodejs.org and just install it there, and that will give you Node.js and npm, which is what we need in order to run Pattern Nav. And if you have not installed Pattern Nav, uh, we are going to be using the Node version of Pattern Nav, which is, is still in beta. It's beta uh, version three. Uh, it's got a couple of glitches still, but for the purpose of this class, is it works just fine. So, um, and we don't need to have Drupal installed. This is not necessarily a Drupal specific class. You can apply this to any platform, really. So, um, whether you use WordPress or anything else, this still applies. So, can you raise your hand if you have those two pieces of software installed? Okay, great. Thank you. So welcome everyone. Thank you for taking the time to be here on this beautiful Saturday summer time. I mean, really, is this where you rather spend your day? Uh, this really dark room uh, looking at me. I mean, I'm sure there's better things out there you can be doing. But um, I've been here myself before. I've been coming to this camp for over 10 years. And, you know, this little sacrifices that we make, right, from not spending the Saturday with a family or friends, um, they pay off eventually, so. You guys are our family and friends. <laughs> there you go, we're family and friends, yeah, so. So thank you, welcome um, to building and styling components. Now this is what I would normally call a prequel of a workshop that we've been doing for a couple of years on uh, component-based development. Uh, what we've discovered during that workshop, which is an all-day workshop, is that people ask us, okay, so we're going to be developing with components, integrating those components with Drupal, but how do you get to building those components? How do you decide what is a component? How do you decide, you know, what name to associate with that component? So this class is for that, is to think about the decision-making on how we arrive to a component that we decide to build. So we're going to talk about, uh, you know, when should the discussion about components start on a project? Uh, who should be involved? What um, uh, requirements do you have for your components? Uh, are they um, supposed to be responsive? Uh, who your audience is? Uh, we're going to talk about the markup, the, the proper markup to use for a component, and things like that. So uh, we could talk about styling, CSS, uh, BAM, uh, all those things, if you never heard of them, we'll, we'll, you, we'll go into detail about those uh, throughout the class. So this is supposed to be a three-part class. It's the only way I could get it to extend that long. I'm hoping that this is enough. This is the first time I do this particular one. So the timing, uh, you know, I have no way of knowing whether the timing will be uh, all we need or, we, or whether we need more time. So we'll find out. 
So the agenda will be, uh, we'll, we'll start with just the basics of atomic design. What is atomic design and how that relates to uh, what we're doing here for components. We'll talk about components, what they are, why you should think about components if you haven't already started working with components. We'll build the components. We have a, a handful of components we'll be building. We'll style those components. Um, and then we'll uh, you know, talk about some resources that you can look at for continuing uh, on this path. And if there's time at the end, we'll have some Q&A. Although the Q&A should be really be throughout the entire class. So feel free to interrupt me, stop me. Uh, if you have any questions, if something doesn't make sense, I'll definitely do my best to answer your questions. If I don't know the answer, I'll point you on the right direction at least. So please, let's make this a more interactive kind of discussion here, okay? So, um, so that's me. Uh, for the past over 10 years, I've been a front-end developer. Recently, I became the head of learning at Media Current. And uh, I've been working with Drupal. As I said before, I've been coming to this camp since 2007. And I remember s going to sessions where I wanted to learn how do I install Drupal. <laughs> that was, I remember those sessions where I didn't know anything about Drupal. I knew very little about front-end development. And so I've been coming to this camp every year. And this camp has been what has made the difference for me. You know, not only you great, meet great people, but the, the things that you learn are really valuable. Uh, and this is the path you want to go. I think you're in the right place. Uh, I am a co-host of the Media Current Podcast. So I encourage you to listen to that, where we talk about front-end solutions. We have uh, different guest speakers uh, all the time. So uh, check out our website for that. And about Media Current. So Media Current uh, is a full service digital agency that implements world-class open source software. We focus on open source software uh, and development strategy design uh, to achieve you know, the goals of our clients, uh, enterprise organizations that are seeking better return on investment. So we pretty much do it all when it comes to the digital uh, world, uh, anything from design, digital strategy, SEO, accessibility, development, training, support. Uh, and so we are always hiring. So we encourage you to um, check out our website for uh, our current positions that are opening. We have a number of positions from project manager to digital strategists, developers, and everything in between. So what are components? You can think of components as building blocks, right? Or in this case, Lego pieces. And these are the small little pieces that allows us to build bigger things, right? We can, uh, our imagination, we can use our imagination and just pretty much build anything with a Lego set. Um, but at the same time, you don't want this kind of Lego pieces, right? Because it just is messy. It's, it's, you, do, you will know where to start. You want some, a little more structure, something that uh, will allow you to uh, get an idea for what you want to build. And I'm sure some of us, I know I remember, when websites were built like this, right? Um, all those animated GIFs and all uh, the good stuff there. This is when we used to build websites from the top to the bottom, right? We would start at the very top of the page. We'll start building our way down until we get to the footer. And that's how you would build websites. Your CSS was a mess because you would follow the same order as well because of the cascading order. And so uh, this approach is no longer maintainable. It's not really practical anymore. And so that's why components are so important. So in relation to uh, web development, components are pretty much breaking down a website like this into smaller pieces, pieces that, you can, that are easy to digest, pieces that you can address individually as their own entity. Uh, the pieces that you pick from a website like this are built independently of anything else. So if I build a button like this, that button will be built as its own entity. And that button will look and, f and, and behave the same way everywhere across my site. It doesn't depend on anything around it to look and, and behave the way it does. And the same for everything else. So that's, uh, uh, in a nutshell, what components are, is building those small pieces. And they don't depend on what page they appear on or what section of the page, right? It's just a component that you can reuse it over and over. And if you need uh, to have a 
different variation of that component, that is one thing we can also do without really having to rebuild the original component all over again from scratch. So we'll touch on that later on. So this uh, in uh, relation with atomic design. So rather than doing the top to bottom building of a website, we look at this new methodology called atomic design introduced by Brad Frost, um, where his, his idea is, okay, why don't we just break things to the smallest pieces possible and start building from there in order to build our websites. So rather than building pages, we're building pieces, we're building components that we can plug in anywhere on our site and at the same time make those components reusable, which is one of the biggest advantages of components. You build something once and you reuse it over and over. So atomic design starts by breaking things down into atoms. Atoms is the smallest pieces possible. Uh, a, an atom could be a button on the website. It could be a label. It could be the title of a page or a, or, a, or a section. Then molecules is a combination of atoms. Uh, when you start building things like um, a card, right, like a content card or media card, where you combine multiple atoms to build that card. Organisms is a collection of molecules. So if you have a content card, maybe an organism will be like a section. It will be like building a collection of cards, a listing of cards, content cards. And so, so that's how things, and then from there, the, uh, the chemistry part, it throws away and then go into templates and pages. <laughs> I, don't, I don't get that part, but. That's what it is. So, but the idea is we're not building full pages, we're building pieces to then build those into templates and then finally pages. And for doing this, we're going to be using a uh, Pattern Lab, which is a design system that provides a living style guide. Very popular for, you can use it on any platform, whether it's WordPress, Drupal, anything else out there. It's technology agnostic and is very non opinionated, well, somewhat. Um, <clears throat> but you have the freedom to use any type of approach you are comfortable with, especially when it comes to writing your CSS. You can use a preprocessor like SAS or LESS um, to write your, your SAS, right, uh, or, or, or LESS code and compile it into CSS, or you can just use vanilla CSS if you like. So uh, we'll, we'll be working with that today. So, you know, the concept again is define ones reused throughout the entire project. The huge advantage on this is that, and we've seen this ourselves firsthand, we work with different clients all the time, and the, the longer we are working on a project, the less things we are building. Because uh, you get to a point where you're just reusing what we already built. And that's huge because that cuts down on development uh, and you know whether it's front end or back end. So you just continue to use what you already built. So, uh, I've been in projects where I'm removed from the front end part of the project before the project launches because I've already done all the front end work that it needs to be done. You know, and uh, uh, we get to a point where it's just a matter of integrating what I built with Drupal. And so I'm not longer building anything else. So my role uh, can be removed from the project and I can move on to another project. So that saves the client uh, money, right? It saves work. And it just provides a lot more consistency on a project, right? Uh, when we want to uh, make an update to anything on the website, we just go directly to the component on that style guide and we make the change there. So any questions about components in general, atomic design? Uh, has anybody not heard about any of those two concepts uh, yet before today? Hey, Brian. <laughs> okay, good. So. <clears throat> We talked about components, right? We talked about the card. Here's an example of how a card will kind of be born in a way. Um, when we talk about components, and some people ask, when do you start talking about components on a project? For us, that conversation begins uh, at the discovery phase or uh, strategy phase because uh, I even had clients uh, talk about components before the project even starts. Uh, I remember a client coming to one of our training workshops 
And after our training, he says, yeah, I want our project to use components. So we hadn't even discussed what the project really was all about, but he already was thinking on components. And so, and that is huge because when you start early on the discussion, then you can make better decisions as to what level of involvement will be, the, the project, um, what components you may need, how you can reuse components, start identifying patterns on how you can build components that you can reuse for multiple uh, tasks. So uh, the example here, we have a card component where it's a single component, but through the use of what is called modifier classes, which we'll talk about in a minute, uh, which is basically a CSS class that you can apply to this component, you can make it look completely different than how it was originally built. So we have a card like this, which is in a vertical format. Through the use of a, a modifier class, you may make it look horizontal. You can make it look larger or smaller. The responsive behavior can be modified. And it's still just one single component that you're building. You're not building multiple ones. So, and here's an example how that single component can be used multiple times on a, for listing of content. This is typical what you will see when you see the listing of news or listing of events or things like that, right? You will see something like this. Uh, on desktop, you will see something horizontal like that. On mobile, you can see that list gone vertical. And again, we're still dealing with just one single component here. So just, just think of the value of that. And here's more examples of that. So I talk, when do when does the conversation should start with components? This is kind of our timeline for us, the way we see it at Media Current for us to start discussing components uh, at the discovery or content strategy phase. Um, some people think that you, know, you start talking about components when you get to development. And by then, it could be very late because you may not have identified potential issues when you, when you start building code, when you start coding. So you can identify those issues if you start that conversation early, is what, are, what type of uh, requirements do we have? What type of mobile behavior do we want for things? You know, what type of screens are we looking at? Uh, things like that. Um, so by having that conversation there, our wireframe can start planning on those components, how they should be built, how they will be used, on not only a desktop, but uh, mobile devices as well. Based on those designs, the client can look at uh, those wireframes and say, oh, okay, I see this may be a problem, you know, if we do this this way for mobile or for desktop, right? So we can alter that during the wireframe phase. Then by the time we get to design, we have a very good idea of things are probably going to work really well based on what we've done with the wireframes. Once the designs have uh, been uh, accepted, then the style guide, which is when we start building the components with code, it will be a, a, a much more uh, reassuring process because there will be no surprises at that time. We have already captured any potential issues before then. So, and so that's, that's when things work much better uh, for your project and your clients if we start that conversation early on. And I know that for clients, it could be an intimidating discussion to have because they may not know what components are. So it's a, it's a matter of educating clients, right, on the, the benefits of components, why you should use them, some of the disadvantages, right? Um, and so that's all part of the process. But the sooner you have the conversation, the better it will be uh, for the overall project. Any questions about that? So I already talked about the tooling we'll be using today. Uh, Pattern Lab, Node.js, and NPM. So those are just building tools, uh, especially Node and NPM. And Pattern Lab is just a style guide, uh, I'm sorry, a design system that we'll be using for cataloging, cataloging our components. Who has used Pattern Lab before? Okay, so the majority have, have not, which is okay. It's not nothing uh, to be concerned about. So uh, in the process of creating components, we're gonna be using what is called a BAM methodology. BAM is a, <coughs> a way of writing CSS that uh, provides meaning to your markup. It provides some kind of relationship between elements of the, of the markup. And BAM stands for Block Element Modifier. And it's a way to create that relationship between things. Like if in, the, in the example of the card, the card will be like the block of that particular entity. 
In the card, we had an image, we had a title. Those will be elements of that block, right? And then the modifier could be uh, a card wide or card horizontal, right? Where we are changing uh, the look and feel of a, an, a component or a block, but without having to build that component all over again. So we'll uh, dig more into that when we start writing the code. And, you'll, and we can kind of uh, go through some examples there too. So I would highly recommend you look at this article by CSS Tricks. It's called BAM 101. It uh, is, is a great methodology to use because it really changes not only um, the way markup looks when you're looking at markup. If you inspect your code and you want to look at the markup, it just it, it, it makes a lot more sense. It's got meaning. But also, it allows you for your code to be flatter, where it is not <clears throat> depending on so much other things. Uh, your code, because those specific CSS classes that you apply, becomes a lot more linear, where you don't have to do a lot of nesting, a lot of dependency of other selectors. Uh, so it's easier uh, to write that code, but it's also easier to maintain, which is the biggest advantage. It's easier to maintain because you're not really having to go through selector after selector after selector in order to override something if you want to change it. It's a very, I said, flat structure for your CSS, which is a huge advantage. OK, so <clears throat> here's an example of what we'll be able to do today. Like a card. And this is probably, I think every project that I worked on, there's always a card <laughs> of some kind. Um, and they're great because it's basically a collection of content, uh, 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 a teaser version of content, right? This could be an article, this could be an event, this could be anything, really. You just encapsulate it into one chunk of content that you can use anywhere on your site. With this one card, which in itself is a collection of other components, for example, the image is a component. The title is a component. The date is a component. In fact, we'll build those separately, individually. Uh, the text and the tags, those are each individual components. You can think of those as atoms, and the card itself will be a molecule. And then from there, we build an organism, which is a section, right? A combination of those. And again, it's the same card. The button in itself is also its own atom. But here we are displaying multiple instances of the same card. Um, and in addition to that, this is the same card, except we've decided to change how this one looks. Rather than being vertical, it's now horizontal. But the elements of it is exactly the same. And it's the same card. We just change it by using a CSS class and adding some styles to that, which we'll do today. Um, and when you put them all together, you'll have something like this. Who has used uh, Twig? Who, uh, okay, So we'll be using Twig for building this. The reason for that, obviously, is Drupal, right? But even if it's not Drupal, if you're building uh, something with Pattern Lab, you have the options to use Mustache, right? which is one of the uh, default languages for Pattern Lab. But Twig is also another option. And uh, what I like about Twig, even if it's not a Drupal project that I'm working on, I use it because of the logic that Twig allows me to do with my data, my markup, and things like that. So just for that in itself, it, 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 clean, it cleans up a lot of the code for you. Otherwise, you have to do a lot of repetitive code if you're using plain HTML, which you can, or mustache. So, But Twig uh, makes sense since we're in the Drupal camp. Um, and um, it is a great, great way to build something like this with uh, very little code. So thank you very much. I hope you had a great day. And <laughs> Sorry. So um, OK, so let's, uh, before we get into coding, anybody has any questions, uh, concerns, or anything? Yes. So you mentioned the disadvantages of Pattern Lab. I'd like to hear those. One disadvantage, and, and, and maybe I shouldn't say disadvantage, but something that some people would have a problem with is uh, that it does take some work up front to get started, um, meaning that you have to invest extra time and effort 
to put all these things in place, the discussions about components, that's a discussion that you didn't have before. Uh, planning the components, figuring out which components to build, figuring out what fields each component will have, the names of those components. So that is work that needs to be done ahead of time before you can start building anything with code. Uh, and so to some people, they, that may seem uh, an extra effort that was not done before, and they may see it as a negative, but that extra effort and time that you spend up front pays off at the end, because then you get to a point where, like I said before, I, I can be removed from a project because you know, uh, everything that I have to build is already built, and people are just reusing what I built. So uh, that's unheard of on, on a typical project where everybody goes until the end of the project. Right? Nobody's removed from the project because they're no longer needed. It's, if anything, people are added to the project at the end, especially when it's time to, uh, to launch. So uh, those kind of things. Um, disadvantage, it's, to some people, it's a still relatively new process. So there's a lot of learning. There's a huge learning curve. Um, I've been doing this for over two years, teaching about it and building for maybe four years. And I'm still learning. It, it's it's continuously evolving uh, approach. Uh, and so, you know, it, 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 that was not the case before. We, if you knew how to build a website, Drupal website, you just go and build another one, build another one. There was the same process over and over. Now this is evolving. You know, with technologies, with mobile devices, and things like that, is a continuously changing uh, landscape. So maybe they're not disadvantages. They're just some things you need to be aware of uh, if you go on this route. And I also have a question, which you could hold to the end of your last session if you want. But uh, pattern lab versus layout builder. So. You can think about that. Yeah, yeah. My, my yeah the question was uh, the difference between Pattern Lab and Layout Building. But layout Builder. Well, Pattern Lab is really uh, a design system that you use um, to catalog your components. And it's not going to replace uh, Layout Builder if you plan to use it in Layout Builder. You will use Layout Builder to build the things or layouts that you build in Pattern Lab. So it's not a replacement, it's not one or the other. Yeah. Sure. Any other questions? OK. So now, the surprising thing with Pattern Lab, uh, I said before that they're not um, opinionated about how you write your CSS, which is a good thing. I mean, you, can, you don't have to learn a whole new system of writing CSS, right? You can continue to use the system that you are feeling comfortable with. The problem with that, though, is that they don't provide a CSS compiling process out of the box. There are some versions of Pattern Lab that do offer, like the, the Gulp version, I think, does offer some compiling processing for your CSS. But the Node version that we're going to be using does not. It's something that you need to put in place yourself. And so rather than making you do that, uh, what we're going to do today is we're going to write just vanilla CSS, right? no SAS. Um, because we need a compiler to compile that SAS into CSS. And although I can easily implement it. I would need you to do the same thing if you want to follow along, and that could become a little too much for some. So we're just going to write regular CSS. Um, if later on you want to convert that and move it to SAS, that's perfectly OK. Um, but, um, so that's just kind of more of a warning of how this is going to work today. So I'm still myself going to have to catch myself <laughs> because I'm not used to writing CSS on its own. It's always been SAS for many years. So um, I'm sure I'll be making some mistakes, so I apologize ahead of time. And so the first thing is if you already installed Pattern Lab, great. If you have not installed Pattern Lab, can you raise your hand if you have not installed Pattern Lab? Or okay, yeah. If you could please install Pattern Lab, the Node version, version three, and you need Node and NPM also. So. Uh, and you can find us, if you go to nodejs.org, uh, there's a package that you can just run um, and install that. Um, now, if you have Pattern Lab, have you created a project already with Pattern Lab, an empty project that you're planning on using here? If you have not, we can go through that right now. So let me walk through that. So I'm going to go to Pattern Lab and go to the download section. Okay. And 
we are going to be using this where it says use pattern lab CLI command line interface. Uh, people say, well, why don't I use you know a more GUI friendly version of it? You could, however, when you're running pattern lab, when you're running node, you're going to be using the command line anyway. So um, you still need to be interacting with the command line. So if you're not well familiar with the command line, we're just going to be running a couple commands throughout the whole class. So it's not, not a big deal. But um, So I'm going to go here. And this is the only thing I need to do to, to get set up. So once you have Node and NPM installed, you should be able to run these commands. And so let me do that. And I'm really taking a big chance because live demos are always not recommended. I already have the site up and running, but I want to kind of show you um, what to expect when you are setting up your project. Again, this is being recorded. I hope uh, I'm not messing it up. So if you need to come back to this later on, uh, you should be able to. So the first thing I'm going to do, um, as, as you see on the instructions here, is uh, we're going to make a directory. And this directory can be called whatever you want. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what you call it. So I'm going to make directory. I'm going to call this. Um, I already have a Drupal Comp LA, so I'm going to call it uh, components. Let's do that. Okay, so if I do an ls, I see my components folder there. The next step is to go inside that folder that you just created. So I'm going to go into components. So I'm inside components now, as you can see here. And finally is running this command, npm create pattern lab, which is the uh, command that will grab all the pieces that, uh, that we need to get pattern lab set up. So I'm going to go npm create pattern, is there a space or not? Oh, hyphen, OK. Pattern lab. And this is going to uh, run for a little bit. It may take a little while, depending on the connection here and, and your computer. So let's just give it some time. It looks like it may take a longer than a little while. Okay, so that is possible because of the connection here. If this doesn't work for us, which may very well be the case, I already have the site up and running, so we can go through that for the uh, for the class. But uh, it will make it very hard for you to follow along if you can't set this up. So. Yeah, mine is not doing anything at all. No, I mean you could, uh, I suppose, and then go inside that folder. Yeah, but downloading it. Okay, now it's moving. It's been installing for ten minutes. OK, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to let mine, OK, so here we go. So the first prompt is to specify the folder where I want Pattern Lab installed. And since I'm already in that folder where I want it, I'm just going to press Enter. If you're not in the folder where you want it, you can just type the path to that folder. So I'm pressing Enter. And it's asking me which edition. And so again, we're going to be using the um, the node version, but uh, we're going to use the Twig edition because we're going to be using Twig for this. Now, the Twig version is still node. It just uses Twig, the Twig engine, to render your, your markup. 
So we're going to do this. Actually, I'm sorry. Let me let me choose Node because we do need the Node version, and the next one is the Starter Kit. Uh, that's when you we choose the tw the Twig version. So let me do Node. I get confused uh, with this. Here we go. So um, I'm going to use the Twig demo. Uh, starter Kit Twig demo. Um, I try not using a Starter Kit because if you scroll keep scrolling down, there is a option for none, no Starter Kit, which will be a bare bones setup of Pattern Lab. But the um, the commands would not run properly, and again, this is still in beta, right? This particular version. That's probably why. So I chose the Twig demo one because it does have components already built, and then those commands run properly. So it sounds like uh, maybe because there's no components on the other one, uh, things don't work as expected. So I'm going to choose the Twig demo, and what this is going to do is going to give me some simple patterns or or components already in Pattern Lab. We're just going to ignore those, and we're going to build our own. Um, so it's asking me, uh, are you happy with your selections? And I'm going to press Enter for yes. And this part will probably take a little, this is the part that will probably take the longest. While that is going, I'm going to temporarily open the project that I already had built so that we can at least start moving forward. And just go over very quickly, very quick, uh, quickly about some things in Pattern Lab, um, just so you can kind of start getting familiar with what everything is in here. Um, so let me collapse some of these things here. Okay, so this is the, um, this is what, once you have Pattern Lab installed and you run the build command to build everything to compile all the code that comes with Pattern Lab, you'll have this kind of structure on, your, on, on the folder that you created, you'll have a structure like this. Um, pattern exports, you don't have to worry about that. The public folder is what everything gets compiled into. This is what your website will look into for rendering your pages, right? The source is where you're going to be working from. Everything that you're going to be writing is going to be inside source, and that gets compiled into public. Uh, the dependency graph, those are just a pattern lab thing. Uh, the package JSON is um, a dependency, a list of dependencies that Pattern Lab needs, things like NPM and other things, and you can add more to those. But when you run your build commands, uh, uh, the build command looks at that file to see what dependencies you need to install and, and, and run, right? Then the Pattern Lab config file is where you can make some configuration changes to Pattern Lab. If there are things that you want to change from Pattern Lab, um, you could, for example, Pattern Lab offers a way for you to test your components on different breakpoints, mobile, tablet, desktop. You can actually determine what the dimension of each of those could be by changing it here, mobile, large. Uh, there's also places where you can change where things should be rendered or what the source, where the source directory is for your things that you're working on and where should they be compiled into. Uh, by default, I wouldn't change any of that, but uh, just to give you an idea that you can actually change things like that here. Um, this, that's what that config file is for. Let's go into the source directory because this is where you'll be spending most of your time. Um, Pattern Lab uses these underscore folders as. Um, the main way in how things are structured in Pattern Lab, right? This determines that this is a Pattern Lab specific uh, structure here. Uh, annotations is uh, a way for you to create annotations for your components. So when you are displaying your components on the Pattern Lab on, on the style guide, you can actually make annotations so that you, if you're working with the team, they can look at your components uh, documentation 
and see exactly you know, what fields this component needs, what the field names are. In the case of Drupal, what should be the machine name for this field, things like that. Uh, data, we're actually going to be using the data JSON file here. So data is kind of like a global data source that we can use to, to give our components uh, dummy data. Everything that you're building in Pattern Lab is just for style guide purposes. So we're going to be putting dummy data into those components, and we can get all that data from here. There's already predefined data fields and elements you can use in your components, and you can also add your own, which I've done myself, and we'll go over those later. But if you just reference something in Twig with, with a key that exists in the data file, Pattern Lab will know to go and grab it and, and make it available to you. Um, so we'll be using this data file for, pop, for populating our components with content, dummy content. Layouts, we're not going to do anything with that, or macros. Now, meta, or meta, there's two files here. One is the foot, and one is the head. The head is a file where you can add new CSS style sheets that you're creating, so that when you look at your components in Pattern Lab, your styles are used to style those components. Um, we have an automated method ourselves um, on my company where all that happens automatically. So we don't have to keep adding those JavaScript uh, uh, CSS styles to the head. But for this class, we're going to be individually adding each of the CSS uh, styles that we create. We're going to be individually adding those to the head file here. If we create any JavaScript, which will not, but if you were to create JavaScript, you will do the same for any JavaScript that you need to add to your components. You will add those in the foot of, of this file here. Yes? Mario, um, you just said something about your company using some kind of, did you say automated meta? Uh, automated method for um, making our scripts and style sheets automatically available to Pattern Lab without, without having to uh, manually adding them, yeah. So we use Gulp, basically. We have several Gulp tasks that um, combines all the um, CSS that we write into a single style sheet. And then that style sheet has already been referenced on Pattern Lab, so the code automatically becomes available. Uh, let me take a look at how this is going. OK, still going. OK. Patterns, this is where magic happens, right? And you remember atomic design, when we talked about atomic design, that's, that's what you'll find under patterns. So patterns or components, you can use either, either terminology. Uh, we have the atoms, molecules, organisms, templates, and pages. So this is what we talked about when we talked about atomic design. Now, Pattern Lab uses these numeric prefixes on those folders and file names. The main reason for doing this is so this is the order in which those uh, sections are ordered on the navigation of Pattern Lab. So when you open Pattern Lab, you'll see a navigation at the top or, or the sidebar. The new version has a sidebar navigation. You can move it to the top. And the options for atoms, molecules, organisms, the order that you see that is, is what that numbers mean, really. That's all the reason for, for using that. There is a bug on this that um, our friend here, Danny, helped us uh, figure out, fix for it. Um, in Pattern Lab, and we'll, we'll take a, a closer look at Pattern Lab in a minute, you can, you can view individual components. If you want to look at a button component, but if you have multiple versions of the button component with different color buttons and things, you can say view all and it will show them all in a page. Well, that option of view all is broken on this version. Uh, but the fix for that is changing the, um, the name of the folder re by removing the numeric digits from the folder. And that fixes the problem. It's, temp it's a temporary bug, because uh, this is still in beta, so eventually it will be fixed, but just FYI. If I go into atoms, so uh, the folders that I was talking about is like this. Originally, they come with a numeric prefix as well. So we do like zero, zero dash buttons, and then by removing the zero, zero dash, it fixed the view all thing? Yeah. Oh, OK, cool. Mm -hmm. Exactly. 
And so, um, so this atoms, this is molecules. Again, most of this is what came with Pattern Lab. I think I only built one, a, handy, a handful of components here myself. Uh, everything else came with Pattern Lab. Um, and then finally, CSS is where, actually, I don't think we're using this at all. This is only if you are supplying CSS. Uh, like if you're bringing in CSS from a third party, like a vendor or something, you can add it here. Uh, but everything gets compiled here. So if I have my CSS, I, since I already built some com the components, I created the CSS files here instead. And once I added those files here, um, and again, we'll go into the step by step with this, uh, then I added those each, each individual style sheet here that I created. Again, we'll cover that. So I just wanted to kind of, this is more of a, a tour of what Pattern Lab is. So, um, well, I'm still going. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to, any questions about Pattern Lab, the structure, the folder structure, do you have any uh, questions about where you should be doing your work? We'll, we'll, we'll get to that, but uh, um, any questions that popped up in your head to, yes, anybody, no? I just want to say, I, I switched to my phone and the thing downloaded just fine. Okay, so if, I, if anybody has a hotspot, maybe that'll be a, a good way to help yourself and help everybody else too. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to, um, I'm in the folder where, that I was just demoing. Um, so I'm going to run this command, npm run start, and this, triggers Pattern Lab to start, to compile the code and start, and then it sits there watching for changes. So every time you make a change, it recompiles and reloads the browser for you. So I'm going to run that. And so here's Pattern Lab. And this is what I was talking about, that, that numeric digits that uh, are prepended to the prefix to the document the folder names is, is how this order is determined here. If you remove the, the prefix, then this will be alphabetically ordered. So, And this part where it says view all, this is the part that was broken. So now it works. It would just spin. It will not load uh, before I had those prefix removed. So here are... This is what you, I don't know uh, if anybody has seen Pattern Lab before, but um, pretty typical. This is your atomic design structure that we discussed before. Yes. What was the command again to start this? npm run start. So right here. Okay. And, and if you notice, the command down here is still sitting there. So if I make a change to one of those files on my components, it'll recompile those changes, and it will reload the, the browser for me, which is nice. Okay. Okay, so it looks like we are done here. So hopefully when yours completes, you will have these three check marks indicating that your Pattern Lab is ready to go. So let me, the first thing you want to do is you want to compile your entire project, right? So we just set up Pattern Lab, but we need to compile everything that comes with Pattern Lab. So let me try this. If we do npm run build, this will build the entire Pattern Lab project. Or maybe not. Uh, um, there is this command here. Um, the package JSON kind of gives us an idea of what commands are available to us. Build is weird because build is there, but I'm gonna do a start on this one also just to so we can do that one. Okay. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop this one since I'm running that one, and I'm going to run the new one we just set up, which will have nothing that we build ourselves. npm run start. Hmm. 
okay let me do this npm install perhaps uh, I need to do that first okay so <coughs> yeah very weird so I'm running npm install to grab everything that is inside the package.json and install all those dependencies uh, let me try this again hmm it's weird yeah, maybe I grabbed the wrong version of, of Pattern Lab. That's the. Oh, I did grab the wrong version, but let me try this. Pattern Lab serve. Okay. Yeah, that was it. Thank you. Oh, that's different. Yeah. I hope I didn't tell you to download the, the wrong version. I, I mean, it's still Pattern Lab. It's just. Yeah. Where are the. Oh. Yeah, do you have any components in yours? Yeah, yeah. I have a different version now somehow. Mine looks like this. Okay. Yeah, that's how it should look. Yeah, like that. And how did you get to that? I did npm run serve. Oh, yeah, that's what I just ran. Sorry. What version did you download? Just look. I did, I did git clone into this folder. Oh, okay. And then I did uh, the command. The command yeah. install, install Pattern Lab, and then I did Same. Yeah, I think. Um, did you do addition node or twig? Um, I think I did node. That's probably why. Uh, we did, I did twig. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. yeah I think I should have done twig. I, um, I should have done uh, addition twig rather than node, and then choose the twig starter. Um, so, if if you are getting this window with no components, um, we may need to choose the other version, pattern lab, so you can get this kind of um, a window similar to what they're seeing, which is the color palette. Um, so, so let's. Um, we're going to go through the explanation of pattern lab. Uh, if you want to redo that, just choose the edition twig, the twig edition, and then the twig demo uh, starter kit. That should get you what I have here myself. So I apologize for that. Um, run start. OK, so right now is almost 11. I think we. We get a break, right? Um, so at 11 is when we start the next section. So let's take the next five minutes uh, as a break and you know, get Pattern Lab up and running, uh, the Twig edition, and then we can start building things on the next section. So I'm going to stop the recording and then res resume again for the next section. <coughs> 